the scary stories will begin in 35 seconds. If you're a subscriber, then you know the deal. But if you're new here, please subscribe. My videos always have minimal ads. And in this video, there's only three mid-roll ads. One after story number one, one after story number two, and one more after story number three. That way you can enjoy the rest of the video ad-free. So again, please subscribe and hit the thumbs up. It really helps me so much. Now, let's begin. This event took place in late November 2018. My parents were out of town for a few nights while I remained home alone. I won't lie, it was all I could have asked for. Watching movies in the living room until sunrise, going to the kitchen at any time in the night, and so on and so forth. On the last night of my time being home alone, I decided to practice my drawing skills while listening to music. While drawing, the idea of forgetting to close one of my kitchen windows would just not leave my mind. Therefore, I decided to leave my bedroom and check the kitchen. As soon as I set foot out of the room, my eyes met with those of an old lady looking directly at me through one of my hallway windows. Her facial features were barely visible, but I could somehow see her wrinkly face. I wasn't afraid that anything bad was going to happen. I was just extremely disturbed by the fact that a random old woman was looking at me through my window late at night. I ran swiftly to the kitchen, opened the window, and asked her if she needed any help. She did not respond or move. She simply stood there. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let her stay outside of my house the entire night. As soon as I opened the door, she slowly moved towards the front gate and left. To this day, I have no idea who she was, why she was on my property, and why she was standing outside my house, staring at me through my window. I was about seven years old, my brother about ten. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was a room which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are windowed doors we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog that we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise, because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised, as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. 
One night I woke up hearing noises outside my window, and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running, and how she called the cops right after. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up. Tall male, wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said that it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. One night, I was staying at a friend's house. He had a relatively large house. His parents weren't home, so there were no cars in the driveway. The house was designed where the garage had a door that entered into the kitchen. He had movement sensor lights in front of his garage. That night, we forgot to close the large garage door, and we were too afraid to go close it because we thought it might wake his older brother, who worked in the morning. We were all chilling in his sunroom, talking about football or girls or whatever. This is at about 1 a.m. Suddenly, we see his lights flick on outside. We remember that the garage door is open and the door coming into the kitchen was unlocked. I sprang up and bolted towards the door. As I turned to the lock, I could see and hear the doorknob jiggling. I tell the others and we all grabbed knives from the kitchen. We then go into his living room, waiting to see if anything else happens. We see flashlights in the backyard hit the glass in the sunroom. We all ducked down to try to avoid being seen. As soon as the flashlights go off, we hear a man groaning outside his window. We pulled back the blinds to take a peek, and we see this man's face pressed up against the glass. He had yellow, missing teeth. We immediately called the police, and when they came, they found nothing. I never spent another night there again. This happened to my best friend's parents. They told me this story about 15 years ago, and still tell it exactly the same to this day. They both swear it's true, and will take this to the grave, so it is either the best kept secret, or it is true. The year was 1969. His parents, let's call them Mark and Sarah, lived in Martinez, a small town about 25 miles east of San Francisco. If you recall, this was prime time for the Zodiac Killer. At this point, they say that the Zodiac had already committed a murder in Benicia, which is about 10 miles from Martinez, and a murder in Vallejo, which is about 15 miles from Martinez. So for the story, Mark and Sarah decided to drive up to a local makeout spot one night during a full moon. This spot is located at the top of a hill, approximately one mile up from the main road. Back then, and even now, at the top is a huge oak tree with a roundabout going around the oak tree. The one road is the only way in and out via car. Everything else is just open space, trees and brush. On this night, they notice a car parked on the other side of the road next to a hiking trail close to the top. They look at each other, noting how out of place it seemed, but carried on. Typically, there are a few cars up there, but never super crowded. When they got to the top, they were one of only two cars. They proceed to pull around the roundabout and park a good distance behind the other car as to not interrupt. As they tell the story, they simply are hanging out and talking for a while, enjoying the fresh air, what have you. After a while, the other car leaves and they decide to take things into the car and start making out. You know how sometimes you get this sensation that you are being watched? You get this general feeling of uneasiness and the hairs on your arms and back of your neck stand up? That is how Sarah describes she began to feel. She tells Mark she wants to go, 
and that she is scared. He reassures her everything is fine. They start to fool around some more. She then says that she notices something moving in the bushes behind the cattle gate. He assures her that it is nothing or just some animal scurrying about. She gives in and they again begin to fool around. She stops him again and says there is something out there behind the gate. Mark turns and notices what appears to be a man standing and pacing behind the cattle gate, which is probably 40 to 50 yards away from them. He tries calming Sarah down some more, who is now visibly shaken. He tells her not to worry and that it is probably a person walking back to the car they saw on the side of the road by the hiking trail. She calms down and they continue to talk and hang out. At this point, Mark himself is a bit leery of this person, so he starts to track his movement. At one point, he notices the person is gone. He figures he hiked away. All of a sudden, Sarah screams, Mark, look! Mark turns around and sees a man standing next to the oak tree, wearing a long coat and a round top hat. Mark turns the car on, and as he turns it over, the man begins running towards the car. The man reaches the car just as it begins to move, opens the passenger side door, and grabs Sarah. Luckily, she was wearing her seatbelt, and the man was unable to pull her out of the car. Mark continues to drive down the road as fast as possible. When they get home, they tell Sarah's parents about the ordeal, but they blow them off as kids telling stories. To this day, they maintain that the Zodiac Killer had almost gotten them. They say that only a couple months after their ordeal, a couple was attacked on the shores of Lake Berryessa, which is about 50 miles north of Martinez. I still remain a bit skeptical, but the fact that three confirmed Zodiac killings happened within a 50 mile radius of Martinez, and they will take that story to the grave with them, makes me think they are telling the truth and the person that they came into contact with that night might have actually been the Zodiac Killer. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still do not know who this man was what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I'm sorry for how long the geographical description is. I just want everyone to understand how secluded I was when this happened, and how badly it could have ended if it wasn't for my parents. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting university. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake, which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk, but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn to the west after a few miles walk, at which point the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I'd continue to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water, it goes up and down and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I had spent many days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years. Never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone-ish. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp bend, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so. As I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, 
which I found strange. I listened well, wondering if it was a lost hunting dog, and started moving towards the sound. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy because of how clear the sound was to be on a collar. I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell that could have been enclosed in a tin or something. And the river was too far. Still, I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally, until I found a badger, a dead one. The sound of the bell had been following the stream, and so had I. So, the badger was put there while I was walking that way. I suppose. I don't know, really. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home at around 6 p.m. I made it to the stream and then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I came because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9 p.m. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while, through the clearest and most open part of the forest, when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, just swinging from a tree. I started gagging. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then, I started fidgeting violently. I was soaking from the rain. My senses became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice-cold water had been thrown over me when I realized that I had walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body after I had passed it on the way there. Someone knew I would see it. So, was someone watching me and running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running, half walking away from the stream, back towards the path for a while, when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, and to go as fast as he could, because someone was in the forest with me. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I just crapped out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise, despite being soaked. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than ever before. The bell went on for a way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear combined with my compromised hearing and the fact that I couldn't flipping breathe properly was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a horse, coughing my lungs up, kind of crying out loud like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half-running, half-speed walking thing again, because I was out of breath. Then, I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest, and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me. A tall figure, creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing ringing this bell 
slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now I don't know if I had a hidden secret sprinting ability or instinctual adrenaline induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I am on the phone with the police. They are on the path. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell. Dad, please, where are you? But I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like the man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard, and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck. And then, switched off. I just ran. I even dropped my bag and only realized I didn't have it anymore when I was in the car. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name, and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car ready to leave, fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car, said he could hear the bell and thought he wouldn't be able to see me. Asked what if I didn't have my phone? What if he hadn't picked me up? They were almost as terrified as me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run and they could hear the danger. They just couldn't see it. The police couldn't really do much. They searched the area and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock. I didn't really question that at the time and my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault. There are just so many what ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and they felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It's like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more detail. I just ran. To this day, I can't go anywhere where I'll be alone. And the sound of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life. So go hug yours now and take badgers and bells as pagan signs that you are unwelcome. So, I have worked in the oil and gas industry on and off for a while. I have spent a lot of time out doing work on wells out in the middle of nowhere in eastern Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. A company I worked for when I was younger had a contract with Chesapeake, which did a ton of work around here, and my job entailed me basically just going to finished well sites and checking on them. Easy job by the way, slept a lot in the middle of nowhere and got paid. I currently work for one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world and have worked for plenty of smaller companies too, so I have seen and experienced some weird freaky things. This is not paranormal. The first pad I ever went to had been finished for months and was basically just becoming overgrown. It was in the middle of nowhere West Virginia, way back in the woods. I went there for three weeks, all midnight shift which was 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. While I was out there, miles from nowhere, with just cows and some horses, I was doing my job when the single light plant out there shut off. The generator that the light plant was attached to had died. 
That alone scared me, because that was my only source of light. It was instantly pitch black. I pulled out my flashlight and walked over to the generator. While I was walking towards the generator to try and restart it, I started hearing some noises on the other side of the little cow fence on the border of the pad and the grass. I stopped in my tracks because unless a cow got out there, shouldn't be anything around. I listened for about 15 seconds to see if I could hear anything, and nothing. So I continued walking, and when I got close to the generator, I heard more rustling just beyond the generator. I walked up to the fence line and shined my light, looking for eye reflections, and couldn't see anything. That's when I heard the gravel behind me shuffle around. I spun around as quickly as I could, ready to use my mag light as a weapon because I am not going down without a fight. It was a coyote, about 15 feet behind me, staring at me, and I just stared at it. Neither of us moved, and I knew I should be able to scare it off easily because of my size and how loud I am. Then I heard some noises behind me, and I spun around again. There were five more coyotes on my side of the little cow fence. I knew then they were going to circle me and try to take me down. I kicked the gravel at them as quickly as I could, spun back around, ran a few feet towards the single coyote and tried to kick rocks at that one, and accidentally flung my boot off, and a one in a million shot actually hit it. I slipped and hit the ground. I got up as quickly as I could and pointed the light around, and couldn't see any of the coyotes. I hobbled over to my boot and then tried to run back to my truck. I jumped in, flipped the headlights on, and there were all six coyotes just standing there, staring at me. I laid on the horn and floored it with the intention of trying to run them over. I missed, and they ended up jumping through the fence, taking off into the field. I ended up parking directly next to the generator, found that it ran out of gas. I filled the generator up, got it started again, and finished doing my work. I could hear the coyotes howling and making all their noises in the field for a couple more hours. Those damn coyotes stalked me three or four nights a week for the next three weeks I was out there. They never did cross the cow fence again. This happened to me during my junior year of college. For context, I am a 22-year-old female. I was driving from my hometown in the Chicago suburbs to University of Missouri, which is about a six-hour drive. I made the drive about every four to six weeks to see my family and my long-distance boyfriend. There are two main ways to take to the town my university is in. Stay on the interstate system through central Illinois and St. Louis, or branch out to back roads after Springfield, Illinois, until picking the interstate back up about 30 minutes from my college. I usually take the back roads, simply because it kept me awake with the constant speed limit changes in occasional towns. But this particular time, I took the interstate system because there was a high potential for winter weather. I was minding my own business, listening to one true crime podcast episode after another, when about an hour from my exit, traffic came to a standstill. Great, I thought. It was already way beyond dark at that point. It was also a Sunday night, and I just wanted to get home and catch a decent night's sleep before my Monday classes. After a while, emergency vehicles flew past the traffic on the shoulder, indicating that there must be an accident up ahead. After what felt like forever, traffic slowly started crawling again and eventually started moving a little as we all passed the accident. This is when it started. I will admit, I like to drive fast on the interstate, especially on this particular drive. What college kid doesn't? I was in the right lane with a decent amount of space between me and the car in front of me. That is when I noticed someone right on my bumper. Seriously? I muttered aloud. Traffic was no longer super heavy and the person could easily pass me in the left lane. Suddenly, the car began flashing their brights at me and honking. I was extremely confused. 
I turned off my podcast and kept a close eye on my rear view. The person continued to flash their brights, half blinding me in the darkness through my mirrors. Jerk, I said, flooring it into the left lane. I maneuvered in and out of a few cars, attempting to get away from whatever issue this person had. Except, they followed my every move. Being a 21-year-old female, I began to get a sick feeling in my stomach. I had listened to enough true crime and general horror stories to be just the right amount of paranoid. The car continued to follow me, flashing its lights and barely letting themselves ever get more than a few cars behind. Or behind and beside me. I finally took the exit to my university. I looked back and the car had followed. It seemed as though the person was trying to get me to pull over. Is there something wrong with my car that I can't see? I wondered silently. Even if there was, there was no way I was pulling over on the side of an interstate in the middle of a dark, rainy night. That is exactly how urban legends or teenage slasher movies start. At this point, I had no idea what to do. Looking back, I really should have driven straight to the local police station, but I was too flustered and scared to think straight. I tried to think back on the last hour or so of my drive. Did I cut anyone off? I didn't think so. I didn't think I had done anything to make any drivers around me this upset. I am a relatively good driver and tend to mind my own business on the road not engaging in road rage or anything stupid like that. I stupidly began driving to my apartment. The car continued to follow, still flashing their lights every so often, but no longer honking. They continued to stay glued to my bumper. I began to panic. What if they followed me all the way home? What should I do? Call the police and send them on a wild goose chase to look for me in this car as I'm driving around town? As I approached another small exit off the local highway, onto a smaller street that ran past campus and toward my apartment, I had an idea. As I got closer to the exit, I did not get into the far right lane to turn off. At the very last second, I jerked the wheel and careened across the gravel shoulder so close to the grass that I barely missed driving off the road. As I gunned it down the exit ramp, I glanced up at the overpass. The car had screeched to a halt and was honking its horn maniacally. I cried the rest of the way home, calling my boyfriend and explaining what had just happened. I never got a good enough look at the car to get a license plate number, or really even a good description of the vehicle, so I never reported the incident to police. To this day, I have no idea what exactly it was that happened that night. My best guess is that whoever this person was they saw me when we were all stopped on the interstate, waiting for the emergency vehicles to clear the scene. It's very clear from the stickers I have on my car, one of my university's name, and one that said, Dog Mom, that I was likely a college-aged female. All this person had to do was end up next to me, see that I was a female driving alone on the interstate in the middle of the night, and have just the wrong intentions. I live in the country and usually love it. I'm a big Pokemon fan and have been for a long time. Last summer I was playing a lot of Pokemon Go. For those who don't know what that is, it is a mobile game that requires you to walk in the real world to catch Pokemon. Post offices and town offices are usually places where you can get new items. Well, I had been busy one day and didn't get a chance to get out and play. It was dark before I had a chance. I decided to go ahead and go for a little walk. It is about a mile round trip to the post office. I've done it before and felt pretty safe about doing it again. It's a very safe neighborhood. I grabbed my phone and headed out. It's a heavily wooded area with a few houses and fields. I had just passed a neighbor's house when I heard it. There was a shuffling in the woods near me. I quickly got on the other side of the street. Deer are pretty common here, and I didn't want one to jump out and run into me. I expected a deer to run out and cross the road, but none came. 
and the noise got louder. I raised my phone up to see if I could use the light to see what it was. The light was far too weak to light anything up. I started walking quicker. I thought it would just go away. I reached my neighbor's house that has rather overgrown fields. I could see the tops of the grass move as whatever or whoever it was moved through it, but I still couldn't see who or what it was. Whatever it was stopped making noise. I reached the post office and checked into my game. Playing helped me relax and I forgot about what had scared me. Then I turned and headed home. As I passed my neighbor's house with the long grass, I heard the movement again. It had waited there for me. Mind you, I was at the post office like 20 minutes because I had a lot to do on my game. As I walked along, I kept my eyes on my feet and didn't dare look into the woods. It was clear whatever was there wasn't going to hurt me. It would have done so already. I didn't want to risk seeing it. I was terrified. I could hear it crashing around in the woods. I thought about calling my husband to come get me, but part of me was scared of making a noise. What if my silence was the only thing that had kept this thing from attacking me? Finally, I reached a neighbor's house that had a big open yard. Whatever or whoever was following me stopped making noise. It seemed like they were going away. I quickly rushed the short distance home and was shaking. I don't know what it was that followed me, and part of me doesn't want to ever know. My husband thinks it was just a curious bear or coyote. That doesn't really make me feel any better. About 15 years ago, when I was 22-ish, my best girl and I went out to the bars three to four plus nights a week and generally met some interesting people and made new friends. There were a few bars that we hit up more than others, and one in particular where we knew the bartender manager pretty well. We went the week of Halloween, and each night, their staff would dress up in a different costume. This is where we came across Ron. He was bouncing at this bar and didn't even catch my eye in the slightest as I gave him my ID to get in. My girl and I hung out, drank and danced, met some people, then headed up to the bar to chat with our friend. He asked me what I thought about Ron. I had no idea who he meant, and he gestured to the bouncer, to which I was like, meh. He was older looking, very muscular. I was 22-ish dressed in black and skulls and platforms. Didn't seem my type on the outside, but bartender friend vouched for him, said he was a really cool guy. He asked if he could give Ron my phone number, and I figured it would be okay. I hear from him the next day, and he wants to hang out. At the time, I lived with my uncle and aunt, so he invited me to meet at his place, and we would just go casually hang out somewhere. Simple middle of the day chill. I get there, and his apartment door is wide open and his much better looking, married, and close to my age best friend is there. He seems nice enough, and I didn't feel unsafe as they left the door wide open, and again, my bartender friend had vouched for him. He mentions he needs to grab a few office supplies, so the three of us pile in his crappy car and head to an office supply store. We go in, and as we walk in, a pretty girl walks by, and he does the head thing and completely stares at her, like the obvious follow her with his head thing. We aren't together, but I found it to be very rude. So later in the car, I mention it. I tell him, Hey look, I know we're just hanging out, but don't disrespect me like that. Everyone looks, but be less obvious and don't make me look like an idiot in public. He laughs and tells me that it's hot that I stood up for myself, especially on our first hangout. Okay. We get back to his place, and as we walk inside, he says, I like that. You're going to have a ring on your finger by December. Remember, we met Halloween week. So anyway, his friend leaves. We get takeout and hang and drink and just talk. Turns out, he is from the same tiny town that my parents are from, which is six hours south of us. 
He is a Desert Storm veteran, which made him more than 20 years older than me, and was back in school to finish his degree, worked full-time during the week, and bounced at night and on weekends. Seemed decent. He asks about my tattoos. I have a lot, and we talk about my love of horror and fascination with true crime and serial killers. He seems interested, but says he doesn't know much about them, so I tell him I'll lend him my encyclopedia of serial killers so it can be like a crash course for him. Maybe a week later, we hang out again, and I bring him the book. We hang multiple times. I even sleep there a few times. One day we were hanging out and day drinking heavily. He says something to me that felt very much like he was getting way too comfortable too fast. Like telling me to do something. I told him not to speak to me that way and turned to walk away when my head jerked back. He had grabbed my hair at the base of my neck. I grabbed his hand and he tried to laugh it off and apologize, saying he didn't mean to be that rough and tried to act like it was some sort of foreplay, but I cut that off real quick. I wanted to leave, but was already very buzzed, so I just sat, and he said he was going to do some work. I thought I would just let the buzz wear off, head home, and never talk to this guy again. While I'm sitting, and he's working, he suddenly decides to tell me in graphic detail about his favorite serial killer in the book, so far, and why. I think the way he is talking about it seems off, but again, I'm just waiting out my buzz. He starts working on a sociology assignment that is studying urban legends and such. He plays videos with horrible creepy content, and it's creeping me out. I realize later that I felt that way because I didn't feel safe with him. I ask him to wait until I'm gone to play it out loud, or put on headphones, and he laughs at me, tells me he can't believe I'm such a poser, tells me, You have all these tattoos and skulls and really you're scared? You look all goth and punk rock, but you're terrified. He laughs this scary laugh, and he is really enjoying that this creeps me out. I don't want to drive even mildly buzzed. I tell him that his reaction is really scaring me, and he loves it. His face gets completely serious, and he suddenly tells me that he has a machete under his mattress. I look and see the handle barely sticking out. He tells me he could make me disappear and nobody would ever find my body. In that moment, my adrenaline hit. I grabbed my bag and ran to my car. He sort of slowly lumbered behind me laughing and telling me not to leave. I am stone cold sober at this point, because of the adrenaline I guess, and start my car. Take off about two minutes down the road, by the mall, and just park and slow my breathing down. I call my girl and just unload. For the next week, he texts and calls me over and over, switching between begging me to give him another chance and berating me, calling me a poser and a fake. I tell our bartender friend, and he can't believe that Ron did all of those things. He only works with him a few more times, and they don't talk. Ron set his sights on someone new, another chick in her early 20s. Her family owns the Vietnamese restaurant in the same strip as the bar. The bartender tells us Ron had just started seeing her and she ended up pregnant immediately. I asked bartender to warn her or give her my number, but he never saw her again. I hope and pray that she didn't get stuck with Ron. And every time I'm in that area, I pray that I don't run into him again. He can keep the encyclopedia. I just hope he hasn't picked up any tips from it. This happened to my older sister when she was at College Town in San Diego. My sister and her friend were playing tennis off campus one night, and her friend decided to bail early to go home. My sister decided to stay a bit longer for whatever reason. She packs up and starts walking back to her car in the parking garage while chatting on the phone with her then boyfriend, now husband, Justin. As she reaches her car in the garage, she notices that she has a flat tire. Kind of odd, considering it was fine a couple hours ago. But nonetheless, 
she's not too concerned. Justin offers to hop in the car and make the 10 minute drive to come help her repair it. As she sits waiting for Justin to show up, a man appears seemingly out of nowhere. She doesn't notice where he came from, just noticed him kind of being there, all of a sudden. She described him as a younger guy, well-dressed and well-groomed. They strike up a conversation, and after a couple of minutes, he asks if she needs any help fixing the flat. She politely declines and mentions that her boyfriend is on his way to fix it. The guy says he really wouldn't mind helping her out, and that it wouldn't take long at all. Seeing as how it was late, and she wanted to go home, she gave in. As they begin to walk to the trunk of the car to get out the spare tire and tools, Justin pulls around the corner in his truck. After Justin gets out and talks to my sister for a second, they notice that the guy is walking down the closest stairwell in a pretty quick hurry. They don't think much of it at the time, and go to the trunk to get the tools and tire. When they get to the trunk, they notice that it is not latched closed. They open the trunk, and inside, they find multiple ropes, a roll of duct tape, and some zip ties, none of which belonged to my sister. Justin immediately calls the police and starts looking for the guy. Police showed up talking to my sister, but never found the guy. I still get chills when walking through parking garages late at night. So back in junior high, I was on the volleyball team. I live in a very rural community. Every year the school would do a little fundraiser for all the sports teams at this tiny park. It had a couple makeshift booths, kitchen area, and stage. Each team would come up with a game and the players would take turns running that booth. In those days I was attached at the hip to one friend in particular who I'm still close with. I shall name her Chris. Both of us played sports and attended this event together. Her mom dropped us off at the park and was to pick us up after the event was over so we could help with cleanup. Both our working shifts were early so we had a lot of downtime. We danced the night away and right before the event was over we decided to play football with some of our friends. This park is basically a bunch of fields and trees separating the different field segments. There is a parking lot when you first enter the park where everyone was parking that night. Directly in front of the parking lot is the location for all the booths. This whole setup is on the top of a big hill, and at the bottom of this hill is where we played football because we had just enough lights from the booth area to see. On with the story. I was picked as a sitter for the first game. I get bored easily and noticed my dad's first cousin was walking around the parking lot. He is on the rescue squad and was basically patrolling it. Now, this man isn't someone I have seen often in my life, but enough that I know who he is and he knows me. Right before this event, my parents went through a divorce. This man and his wife picked up some furniture with my mom for her new home. They were literally with us the entire day about two weeks before this event. The following conversation just gets creepier the older I get. I walked up to the cousin and said, hey, how are you? He responds with, hey, girl, which is a very usual response for him and wraps his arm around my shoulders. Again, very normal behavior for him. No red flags. We make small talk and he asks polite questions about my family that I politely answer. The whole time we are talking, he asks normal adult questions and I bring up the furniture he moved into my house. This is where things got weird. This whole time, he is walking me around these cars with his arm around my shoulders. It's a decent sized lot, and I realize we are heading to the far corner, about two car lengths until we reach darkness and a grove of woods that circles down around this park. I stop, but he keeps gently guiding me towards this grove of trees. It's weird, and I'm starting to sense some red flags. His grip has also tightened up a bit, but at the time, I'm just confused about what's happening. I put my arm around his lower back and sort of spin us around so we get a few feet back towards the center of the lot. 
I have surprised him a little, but when we regain our footing, he just stops moving and stands there, arms still around me. At this point, I keep saying my friends are waiting and I need to go. Yet he just keeps talking. I'm no longer letting him guide me around. And just when I'm about to kick him in the sunshine place, I hear Chris. She yells very loudly and comes running into the lot. She also makes a big show of getting her basketball coach's attention, saying we would be right over to do something. Finally, the death grip loosens and I walk away. My mind was reeling and I was so confused, but I wanted this guy to realize I was onto him. I turned once I was at a safe distance and said that I would tell my dad he said hello. This goofy clown of a man straight blank says, Who's your father? I'm completely flabbergasted, but tell him my dad's name. Even though it was under bad lighting, I swear the color drained from his face. He just said, Oh, and walked away. To this day, I have no idea who this man thought I was, or why he was guiding me to the dark. We talked about both my parents and their divorce during our stroll around, so it beats me. I did tell my mom about the situation, and she just said he's a goofball and to stay away from him. I just hope some younger person can learn something. I was too terrified of making a scene and really think, looking back on it, I was in danger. My friend Chris later told me she had watched part of what happened and got creeped out because she realized where he was leading me and that I was very clearly trying to walk away. That's why she ran over screaming and got the adult's attention. It's so weird because as a young person, you're so afraid of causing a scene over nothing, but your safety is more important than that. If a situation ever makes you uncomfortable, do everything you can to get out.
Thank you.